Well, brethren, I remind you that in this particular uh, section of our study together, I'm seeking to lay before you seven axioms which are applicable to the content and form of all of our efforts to preach the Word of God. We're presently examining the third of those seven axioms, namely, that the proclamation, explanation, and application of biblical truth with perspicuity of form and of structure must constitute our continuous conscious endeavor. As we began to grapple with this axiom in the previous hour, I sought to cover ground under three headings. We spent a few minutes setting out a definition and explanation of the key words in that axiom. Secondly, the importance of perspicuity of form and structure, two ways in which it's important for the preacher, five ways in which it is important for the listener. And then thirdly, we considered the price of attaining and growing in perspicuity of form and structure in our sermonic endeavors. In this hour, I'll attempt to complete our consideration of this axiom by addressing two simple but vital questions. First, what constitutes perspicuity of form and of structure? And then secondly, how should we cultivate perspicuity of form and of structure? Now, before addressing these two questions, I want to state two qualifying principles which materially influence all that I say in answering those two questions. Without the recognition of these qualifying principles, we will end up denying some crucial aspects of God's rights in making both creative distinctions and sovereignly exercising his rights in the endowments of spiritual gift. No theology of preaching can be sound and biblical which impinges upon God's rights both as creator and also as the one who gives gifts according to his own will. If we do not recognize these qualifying principles, it will result to some degree in bondage, unrealistic goals, discouragement, and unnaturalness that will not at all be helpful in our ministries. And what are the two qualifying principles? Well, first of all, there exists in preachers a legitimate diversity of organizational taste and inclination. Perhaps I can best convey the meaning of my words by the use of a simple analogy and illustration. I want you to imagine with me that there is a home with two identically shaped rooms. They have the same number of windows, the same shape to the rooms, the color of the paint on the walls and the ceiling, all exactly the same. One room is the mirror image of another. Stacked in the middle of each room is a combination of items with which to furnish each room. There's an identical number, both of color, shape, size, style, etc. There's one couch, two stuffed chairs, three end tables, two lamps, five throw pillows, two area rugs, two planters, and five wall hangings. You look in one room, you find it all stacked in the center. You look at the other, it's all stacked in the center. Now, we take two women. We place one in each room with the charge to take one hour with the help of two men to do the shuffling of the heavier items, to do everything that she orders, and we tell each woman you are to arrange all of the furnishings in a neat, symmetrical, aesthetically pleasing, and functional way. All right? Mirror image rooms, exactly the same material stacked in the middle, two men to be the ones who do the grunt work. We come back in an hour, and what will we find? 
Well, I doubt we would find both rooms arranged in exactly the same way. When we walk into the first room, we look around, we sit on the chair, we sit on the couch, we look at the wall hangings, and we feel comfortable. We find that everything is functionally arranged, aesthetically pleasing to the eyes, but the rooms are not identical. Why? Because in those two women, there are differing natural taste and inclinations with regard to how to furnish a room. Further, if you were to bring in two experts and ask them to make a judgment which was the better room as to its arrangement, you might find the experts differing because the experts have naturally differing taste and inclinations. Well, I hope you can see my application. In the matter of perspicuity of form and structure, the number of divisions, the use or non-use of alliteration, a host of other devices aim to make what we say perspicuous in form and structure, there are natural, native differences of inclination and taste with regard to these matters, and we must recognize that in all of our endeavors in this area. Broadus wisely says, it is unwise to set up at the outset some standard of excellence and aim to conform to that. If one should take a fancy that cedar trees are more beautiful than oaks and attempt to trim his oaks into the shape and color them into the hue of cedars, the result could only be ridiculous. Let the young cedar grow as a cedar and the young oak as an oak, but straighten prune, improve each of them into the best possible tree of its kind. And so as to speaking, be always yourself, your actual natural self, but yourself developed, corrected, improved into the very best you are by nature capable of becoming. So this qualifying principle, before we take up the question, what constitutes perspicuity of form and structure, to recognize that there are these differences of native inclination and taste. But then secondly, there exist in preachers varying degrees of God-given organizational ability and aptitude. Surely it's obvious that the man who cannot attain sufficient perspicuity of form and structure so as to be understood by the average serious listener lacks one of the non-negotiable requirements for an elder. I dealt with that in the previous hour. He must be an apt teacher. He must be able both to exhort in the sound doctrine and to convince the gainsayer. A man who cannot arrange the raw materials of biblical truth or truths and so present them as to feed with knowledge and understanding and convince those who are guilty of error is not yet at least at this time warranted to regard himself as a gift of Christ to his church. Now going back to our illustration. If we take a random sampling of a hundred people, bring them by both rooms and say, which room has the better arrangement? Seventy may say room number one. Thirty may say room number two. It may be to the average onlooker that room number one has certain matters of the arrangement that make it more pleasing to the eyes, a bit more functional, but there are still 30 who think room number two is better or equal to room number one. Furthermore, we find upon inquiry that it took the woman in room number one only 20 minutes to make all her arrangements, and she spent the last 40 minutes sipping tea, looking at the clouds floating by. 
The woman in room number two, she used up the whole hour. What does this indicate? That there exists a diversity of native and acquired ability to organize a room aesthetically and functionally pleasing. That's what it indicates. Now, what's the responsibility of the woman who did room number one? Is she should go around strutting like a peacock? I can really arrange rooms well. No, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, what have you that you did not receive? She's to have a humble attitude of appreciation that God has given her an unusual gift in this area of organizational ability and aptitude. Furthermore, she's not to despise the woman in number two. She's not to be lazy and coast, but to recognize I have an area where I can excel to the glory of God. And furthermore, I can take my sister in room number two and I can help her to improve and become a better organizer of rooms. And what should be the attitude of the woman in room number two? Is she to be jealous of the woman in room number one and go around in a funk and sulk because she doesn't have the same degree of aptitude? Of course not. Is she to throw up her hands and resign herself to her present level of ability? No. Is she slavishly to imitate the woman in room number one? No. She should do what Romans 12, 3 says. She's to think soberly, according as God has dealt to each man the measure of grace. And she's to assess where she is. She's to seek the help of the woman in room number one. And she's to strive for excellence. Now the application is clear, I trust. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your utmost. To show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, cutting a straight course in the word of truth. And in this area of organizational ability and aptitude, we need to strive and give ourselves to diligence so that 1 Timothy 4.15 is evidently being worked out in us. Give yourself wholly to these things, to what end? That your progress may be manifested unto all. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, when I come back again and I get talking with the church members at Ephesus about you and your labors and say, you know, isn't Timothy becoming a man of God in his preaching? They should be able to say, Paul, you ain't heard nothing yet. Since you've been gone the last time you were here, he has developed tremendously. His sermons are much clearer and much more precise, and he lays out the truth of God clearly and compellingly. That ought to be our disposition. So, those two qualifying principles to recognize a legitimate diversity of organizational taste and inclination so that we're not forced into a wooden framework and that there are varying degrees of God-given organizational ability. Now then, we come to our two questions. Question one, what constitutes perspicuity of form and of structure? It is in this area that we are dependent almost entirely upon general revelation. And brethren, I remind you that general revelation is revelation. Paul did not have any reservation to say in 1 Corinthians 11 when dealing with this matter of the head covering, doth not nature itself teach you? And what God would teach us through nature, we are to learn. And so in this matter of seeking to get a handle on what constitutes perspicuity of form and structure, we are dependent almost entirely upon general revelation. However, there are ample illustrations and analogies to be found in the written Word of God. Various schools of rhetoric have differing ways of describing what constitutes perspicuity of form and structure. I give you my own eclectic opinion, and I want you to note with me five things. They are listed there in your outline. Perspicuity of form and structure begins with order. And what do I mean by the use of this word? I mean independent identity 
that issues in sequential progression of thought. For order, I'm thinking of that which has independent identity, but there is in that independent identity a sequential progression in moving to the next area of concern. Many of the older writers use the analogy of an army, something that ought to be vivid in our minds in these days of constant international conflict. In an army, you will find individual identity of the various elements, infantry, artillery, tank battalions, missile launchers. But when you have an army functioning as an army, that individual identity is found in a functional sequence with missile launchers and artillery at the rear, and then the tanks and then the infantry in front of and accompanying the tanks as they move into the area. Similarly, in preaching, the order may be logical. What? Why? So what? Chronological, the beginning, middle, and end, particularly in narrative preaching. It may be functional. Your purpose may determine the arrangement. But in preaching, the order can take a number of these forms, but order there must be. Order with respect to specific identifiable parts, the mere making of numbers and letters and outlines does not mean that there is perspicuity of form and of structure. In addition to the specific identity of the parts, there must be rational, sequential arrangement of those parts. God's work in creation is an example. He takes the formless mass that we read about in Genesis 1-2, and out of it he makes an orderly and a functional and a beautiful cosmos and world. Dabney is helpful to us when he says, in speaking you address your hearers a series of thoughts which he is to remember. Now, do you not see that every trait of natural order in the ranking of these thoughts diminishes your hearer's labor? The memory takes them up with ease because their connections with each other present them to her ready grasp. The more exactly they are arranged under their several proper heads and the more correctly their sequence is conformed to the logical order of nature which proceeds from the premise to proof and from conviction to action, the easier it is for your hearer to regain them. Correct method is essential to strength. And then he goes on to illustrate it in a number of ways, concluding with the statement, the mind intuitively apprehends beauty and method, while confusion is always unsightly to it. Let us not disdain this element as unworthy of the gravity of sacred discourse. No innocent means are unworthy, which assist even in the slight degree in commending saving truth. Moreover, I avow that when I observe how our Maker has framed our laws of taste so that the sentiment of intellectual beauty always waits most instinctively on those sequences which are most true and just, I cannot depreciate it. It is a noble thing to make the truth beautiful. That's the language of general revelation. And our brother long since gone home to glory, is urging us that our sermons be marked by order. But then the second element in perspicuity of form and structure is that of unity, a unity. This element has already been anticipated in the idea of sequential progression, but it demands a separate heading to bring it into focus. Generally speaking, a sermon should not be two, three, or six mini-sermons on diverse subjects, all put together because laziness kept the preacher from developing one of them 
into a whole sermon or by a false sense of filling up a certain amount of time, he really preaches two or three mini sermons. Now granted, since the Holy Spirit has given us 1 Corinthians as an inspired book of Scripture, we can never say that a pastoral exhortation may not be comprised of a series of unrelated issues being addressed to the people of God. Now concerning, now concerning, now concerning, now concerning. So we can't say we should never stand in the pulpit and say, brethren, as I've moved among you in the light of certain circumstances in our life together, there are three distinct concerns that I want to address this morning. They may have no logical connection, and it may be perfectly proper, but that's the exception. We're talking about the ordinary pulpit exercises in which our sermon should be marked by unity. Whatever the divisions may be, there is unity and those exceptions only underscore the, the ordinary pattern. I like to think of it as the relationship between a mother and the baby in her womb. The mother has her own individual identity. The baby in her womb has its own individual identity, but they are joined together in a common life by an umbilical cord. And that's the way our sermons ought to be each of our headings having distinct individual identity, but they are joined by the umbilical cord of the unity of discourse. Again, our sermon should be reflective of the greatest mystery of being, the triune Godhead. Three in one, one in three. Unity in diversity, diversity and plurality in unity. One God. We don't worship three gods, but one God in the mystery of his tri-personhood, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Listen to the voice of several of the old writers on this matter of the necessity of unity when it comes to perspicuity of form and of structure. First of all, from Broadus. It's little to say that they must not be incongruous, that is, our divisions, though preachers of some ability do at times throw together matters which have as little congruity as the human head, a horse's neck, a body composed of parts brought from all directions and covered with many kinds of feathers, and the whole ending in a fish's tail, according to the well-known warning of Horace. But the important precept is that the divisions must all sustain the same kind of relation to the subject proposed. Nothing is more common among the faults of inexperienced preachers than to see three divisions, one of which is not coordinate with the other two, but only with some other proposition of which those two are really subdivisions some of the divisions are branches of the tree, and others are but branches of the branches. This fault should be carefully guarded against. And then Dabney, speaking to the same issue, the heads of our sermons must each one present a branch of the dis discussion distinct from the others and coordinate with them in relationship to the main subject. Never make a division without a difference. The inevitable result is confusion and error, for the lines of thought in the two divisions being virtually the same, the preacher will be guilty of anticipation and repetition. It is not enough that the heads be truly distinct. They must also be coordinate. If the real relation of a thought is subordinate to that which you propose to make your second head, it is a vicious arrangement to exalt it into the first or third head and to give it a separate treatment. It should be reduced to a subdivision of the head under which it belongs that it may be promptly and correctly treated under its own class. A moment's reflection will show you that the attempt to expand it independently must introduce repetition or obscurity. 
and all of the old masters speak to this issue as crucial to perspicuity of both form and of structure. But there's a third element contributing to this perspicuity of form and structure, and I'm calling it proportion or symmetry. Proportion is defined in Webster's Dictionary as, quote, the composition, I'm sorry, the comparative relation between parts with respect to size and amount. The comparative relationship between parts with respect to size and amount. Now it's God who has given us eyes and minds that are attracted to the proportionate and revulsed at the disproportionate. If I were to ask someone, what are the main parts of the human physiology, the main parts of a normal, ordinary human body, and they were to answer me, the head, the chest, the arms, the legs, and the toenails. You say, well, wait, wait a minute. Something's not right. You've taken this major part of the upper part of the human physiology, the head, and then you've taken the chest and the arms, and the legs, and now you've descended to toenails. No, no, toenails belong to a subpoint or a sub-subpoint. They're not part of those major components of the human body. And so in our preaching, we must be careful that our heads are proportionate and symmetrical. Now, in some preaching of some text, in some passages, that proportion does not mean that we give equal amount of time to the exposition. For example, if we were preaching on Romans 12, verse 1, verse 2 together, and we were to give a title to such a sermon on the call to utter uh, surrender to God or something of that nature, you would have, first of all, the manner of Paul's appeal. I beseech you, brethren, he doesn't command them. He takes the posture of the bent knee and the outstretched hand. Then the basis of his appeal, by the mercies of God, in the light of what he has opened up of the mercies of God revealed in his salvation in Jesus Christ, bringing us into the justified, sanctified state. Then the substance of his appeal, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. If I were to put blocks on the board, the manner of his appeal would be a small block. A bigger block would be the basis, but the largest block would be the substance of his appeal. But there would be both unity and proportion and symmetry, letting the text determine those matters in a very natural way. This element in clarity underscores the necessity of skeletonizing early in your preparation so that as the ideas multiply, you do not get things out of proportion or out of place. And then we come to the fourth element of this matter of perspicuity of form and structure, and I'm using the word simplicity. And I'm using it in its classic sense, which is, quote, freedom from intricacy and complexity. Intricacy, from the Latin to entangle or perplex, hard to follow or understand because full of puzzling parts, details or relationships. It's like the ornate and detailed carvings on old architecture and furniture. How anybody finds that stuff attractive is absolutely baffles me. Where you've got all these curlies, squirrelies, and uh, cuts in here, and the lion's heads, and fish tails, and, and you, you, I find it just absolutely confusing. Just look at that mass of all that details. That's what I'm talking about. Simplicity is the opposite of intricacy and complexity. That which is characterized by so many elaborately interrelated or interconnected parts that much study is needed to understand it. Our preaching must be marked by the opposite of complexity and intricacy. The order and structure must not only be latent or subtle, but patent and prominent. Furthermore, 
It ought not to be marked by an excessive number of main headings or an inordinate amount of subdivisions. So in this aspect of perspicuity, some of the old Puritans are bad models, bad models, bad, bad models. Some of them are good models, Flavel, Watson, Manton, and others. But some of them, I wonder if they actually preach that stuff, the people that sat and listened to them deserve a medal. I mean, one point after another, and subpoints under subpoints, the demands that it made upon people's minds with no text in front of them, no outline in front of them, they are not good models of simplicity in preaching. Listen to the wise counsel, first of all, of Dabney. Prolixity, therefore, is a sin against movement. Every epithet should be retrenched, which adds nothing to the true rendering of the thought. This virtue is violated, of course, by all needless repetitions, by all digressions and episodes which lead away from the true path of the discussion, by tedious or superfluous explanation and definition. It is marred also by useless subdivisions and by every formal appendage to the method of the discourse which is not necessary to make its order clear. This remark will explain to you the excessive dryness which you have doubtless felt in reading the multiplied subdivisions of some of the Puritan divines. It is as though the progress of the mind toward its goal were arrested at every third step for some useless formality. What can be more wearisome to the eager mind than such a journey? It's like trying to run a hundred yard dash one stride at a time. You can't do it. You gather momentum uh, in, a, in a dash. But in some kinds of preaching, you're stopping continually for divisions and subdivisions, and it goes against the way God has made the human mind to be able to grasp the thought of another. Not only did Dabney speak to the issue, but we find Shedd addressing the issue. Some ministers, says an old homilist, do with their text what the Levite did with his concubine. (laughs) Cut and carve it into so many pieces. Some sermons exhibit a body of proof which, owing to the multitude of the divisions in some divisions, is wholly unsuited for the purposes of persuasive discourse. They are good illustrations of the infinite divisibility of matter, but produce no conviction in the popular mind because they employ the philosophical instead of the rhetorical mode of demonstration." Does this proposed head really tend to prove the proposition? Does it afford a positively new item of proof that is not contained in the other head? These two questions, rigorously applied, will exclude from the sermon all second-rate arguments, and the pulpit will bring to bear upon the popular audience only the strongest, plainest, and most cogent proofs. And so the old masters, recognizing this, and you have it in the remainder of your notes, seek constantly to underscore the necessity of simplicity. Now it will cost you great pains and arduous labor, sometimes more than at others. But if you love your people, You will say with the apostle, most gladly, therefore, will I spend and be spent out for your sake. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 15. But then the fifth thing that is involved in this matter of perspicuity of form and structure is completeness. A sermon must have both a beginning, a middle, and an end. It must not leave the bank by its introduction, go midstream in its argument or exposition without connecting to the other side of the stream and landing the hearers safely on the bank of the other side of the river. 
A man may construct a bridge halfway across a deep gorge. It may have order and unity and proportion and simplicity. But if it doesn't solidly connect to the other side of the gorge, I'm not walking on it. I'll clue you. I'll admire his bridge from a distance, but you won't find me walking on it. Likewise, our sermons to be perspicuous in form and structure must establish a doctrine or a duty, opened up a given portion of the word of God, brought it to bear upon the conscience of the people, and it must have served a specific purpose. No matter how long a series of topical or consecutive expositions may be, each one must be complete in itself. And that's a crucial principle in our preaching. If our people are to come and have a sense that they've heard the voice of God, they know what God is saying to them by way of promise or demand or of rebuke, there must be in our preaching this matter of completeness. So I leave you with these five aspects of what constitutes perspicuity of form and of structure. Some of you have much more native feel for these things. You do them naturally. Some of you, you will have to consciously ask yourself, does this sermon have order, unity? Is it proportionate? Is there simplicity? And is there completeness? And go back through and work on the structure of the sermon so that by God's grace and by virtue of your own pains and labor, you may preach sermons marked by perspicuity of form and of structure. Now we come to the second issue, second question. Having answered the question, what constitutes perspicuity of form and structure, how should we cultivate perspicuity of form and structure? And I will give you five directives. Number one, maintain the conviction that the salvation and edification of your hearers demands it. The great end of our preaching, as I've emphasized in an earlier lecture, must, uh, early, earlier lecture must always be that we want to see sinners saved and saints edified. And there's an interesting passage in the book of Acts regarding the preaching of God's servants in Iconium, Acts 14 and verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they entered together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake. They spoke in such a manner that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. Very interestingly, just a few verses before, Luke had written in verse 48 of chapter 13, and as the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. God's elect were brought in. But chapter 14 says that in the bringing in of his elect, there is a manner of spirit speaking that God owns in a peculiar way. They so spake that many were brought to faith. A great multitude of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. And so as we keep before us that there is this intimate connection between God's sovereign, eternal, electing purposes of grace and the means by which he will call out his elect, we will feel the pressure upon our consciences that we must seek to have perspicuity of form and of structure because it contributes greatly to having what we say easily understood. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 8 and 9. Then second word of counsel is not only maintain that conviction that demands it, but continually read and reread the available proven guides on this subject. 
Some of the older guides not readily available are listed in Dabney on page five of his Lectures on Sacred Rhetoric, where he acknowledges the classic rhetoricians that were helpful to him in the composition of his lectures. And then in Broadus's The Preparation and Delivery of Sermons, chapters 12 and 13. But now we have some good reprints of Dabney, who gives us the fruit of his interaction with the classic rhetoricians, uh, Lloyd-Jones section on this matter, add to these, add to these some basic texts on the composition of essays and public speaking texts that will give you some very practical helps with respect to this matter of the cultivation of clarity. They would say they wouldn't use the term perspicuity of our sermons. Thirdly, continually expose yourself to good models of perspicuity of form and of structure. Expose yourself to good models. I've said for a number of years that I believe preaching in great measure is an unconscious, spiritual, imitative art form. Good preaching comes from listening to good preaching. And there is an unconscious, imitative impress of sitting under good preaching, listening to good preaching. And so my counsel is, if you would improve in the matter of perspicuity of form and structure, expose yourself to good models of form and structure. Some of those models have their sermons embalmed in printer's ink. Listen to the statements about McShane's preaching. After announcing the subject of his discourse, he used generally to show the position it occupied in the context and then proceed to bring out the doctrines of the text in the manner of our old divines. This done, he divided his subject and herein he was eminently skillful. The heads of his sermon, said a friend, were not the milestones that tell you how near you are to your journey's end, but they were nails which fixed and fastened all he said. Divisions are often dry, but not so McShane's divisions. They were so textual and so feeling, and they brought out the spirit of a passage so surprisingly. Well, you read McShane. We now have volumes of his sermons and we can see how he did these things and imitate him. I exhort you to read the men who held the common people in their grip, of whom it could be said as it was of our Lord, the common people heard him gladly, Spurgeon and Ryle. I don't like it when Spurgeon gets bad press. I'm talking about the Spurgeon of his sermons, not the Spurgeon of morning and evening. There are times in that devotional volume, morning and evening, when Spurgeon takes a lot of liberties we would not feel at liberty to take in our handling of the scriptures. But when Spurgeon, the preacher, found in the volumes of his sermons, you expose yourself to him and you find here's a man sensitive to context, sensitive to the linguistic stuff of a text who obviously did his exegetical work, but whose headings are clear, who carries you along as you read perspicuity of form and of structure. The same thing with Bishop Ryle. Read commentators whose example is good. John Brown on Peter and on Hebrews, an excellent model of perspicuity of form and of structure. Listen to the taped or CD or get off the internet, the sermons of men who are gathering and holding congregations not by the charisma of their personality, but by solid biblical preaching. And note this element. How do they do it? How do they open up the text in a way that there is perspicuity of form and of structure. You come away from listening and say, I know where he began, told me where he was going. We went there together and we arrived. This will be a great help to any one of us. And then fourthly, secure the constructive criticism of competent critics. 
I think it was Tozer who said, whenever someone criticizes me, I look for the oil on their forehead. I like that. I look for the oil on their forehead. Are they someone who has Holy Spirit discernment? If you listen to some people who criticize you, it'll bury you with discouragement. Some other people who will commend you, it will inflate you with a false sense of who and what you are. But look for competent critics. I hope your wife is objective with you as a preacher. There's nothing worse for a preacher than to have a wife who looks at him through rose-colored glasses and can't be objective with him and say to him very lovingly at the right time in the right circumstances, dear, you had a rough time this morning, didn't you? You, you were struggling, weren't you? I was praying for you. And I hope she's that kind of a wife. And then you say, yeah, I was, dear. Well, could it be that? And she may help you to see that it was the lack of perspicuity of form and structure that caused you to waffle about trying to find your way. No wonder the people couldn't find their way. So expose yourself to the criticism of competent critics. Seek out those discerning, spiritually mature people in the flock of God. Ask God to nail to the cross of Christ the curse of insecurity and pride which would keep you from welcoming the input of competent critics. That's all it is, brethren. It's just unmortified pride, and you need to go to a place called Calvary and there reckon yourself in union with Christ to be dead to that stinking spirit of pride that would keep you from the benefit of the criticism of competent critics. And then, fifthly, my fifth word of counsel is give yourself to constant labor to improve in this area of preaching. I come back to 1 Timothy 4.15. Be diligent in these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your progress may be manifest unto all. Brethren, that's been one of my life verses. And I've asked God that even when the physical powers begin to wane, as they definitely are, I trust he will give me my mental faculties, but until such time as God would begin to take those away, that I'll never coast. Never coast. It's one of the benefits of a lengthy pastorate, because your people are growing in their capacity to know what preaching is, and so they have a higher and higher standard. And it keeps, as it were, the blowtorch on your britches to continue to press on and not to coast. You can go into a new situation and people may treat you like you're Whitfield and Spurgeon and Edwards in one man rolled up and back from the dead. When the reality is they've had such a poor ministry that your ministry seems marvelous. But you're winning with the people that know you and are hearing you week after week, month after month, decade after decade. It's a marvelous means of grace to keep you pressing on, seeking to improve in this area to the glory of God and to the benefit of your people. Listen to the old masters who give us a word of instruction about this matter of pressing on. I read, first of all, from Shedd. I've got time to read, I think, both of these. But a powerful methodizing ability implies severe tasking of the intellect, a severe exercise of its faculties, whereby it acquires the power of seizing the main points of a subject with the certainty of an instinct and then holding them with the strength of a vice. And all this, too, while the feelings and the imagination, the rhetorical powers of the soul are filling out and clothing the structure with the vitality and warmth and beauty of a living thing. This power of quickly and densely methodizing can be attained only by diligent and persevering discipline, and hence it should be kept constantly before the eyes of the preacher as an aim from the beginning to the end of his educational and professional career. In other words, Shedd is saying you will have to work at perspicuity of form and structure 
all of your days. And then Blakey writes, but a fault of this kind is trivial compared to that of preaching on a subject that has not been clearly thought out. There is a snare in natural fluency, the fluent man being often tempted to neglect clearness and directness of statement and simplicity of method. He is tempted to dispense with that most useful, though often intensely irksome process, getting hold of his own thoughts, ascertaining precisely what they are, and separating them from every particle of obscurity. And then he goes on to describe how that process operates. And he concludes by saying, nothing can be more valuable than the mental discipline of clearing the obscure and marshalling the tangled in our own minds. Nor does it follow that the same toil and trouble will always be required. A habit of clearness will be attained, which will by and by supersede the necessity of the efforts through which it was acquired. He says that hopefully with the passing of time, the mind is trained in laboring for perspicuity of form and structure, that the task will become easier. And I can testify that that's true, though from time to time, God puts you back in kindergarten with a given subject, a given text, and you feel like you're starting all over again. And that's good for us causes us to cry to God, causes us to bend all of our faculties, determine that we shall not offer to the Lord that which cost us nothing. So may God help us, brethren, that whatever else marks our preaching, there will be solid biblical substance, that there will be clarity of perspicuity, of form and of structure, and that our people will profit from that ministry as long as we are privileged to preach to them. Let's pray together. O oh, our Father, what a high and noble task has been assigned to us. And again, we pray that you would forgive us when through laziness and indulgence of our flesh, we have refused that labor which was demanded of us and we've given to our people something that was less clear than it could have been had we bent more of our faculties to the task at hand. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus, we have forgiveness for all of our sins. We have a righteousness of his perfect obedience. We thank you that he never opened his mouth, but what he gave to those who heard him his best. And we hide in his perfect obedience in every aspect of his life and labors. And while hiding in him, we pray that from him we may receive new measures of grace to be better preachers. O oh Lord, help us. By your Holy Spirit we plead. In Jesus' name, amen.